The Sex Determinant in Mormon Theology A Study in the Erotogenesis of Religion by Theodore Schroeder Years ago, while a resident of Utah, I was engaged in an elaborate study of Mormonism for purely controversial purposes. At that time, I had never heard that anyone asserted a psychic correlation between religion and sensualism. My reading of Mormon literature convinced me of a concurrence of great religious and sexual enthusiasm, and the predominance of sexual reasons for most of the peculiarities of Mormon theology. This first suggested to me a causal relation between religion and lust. Since many religions have been examined, and I find that conditions which at first were thought of peculiar to Mormonism are in fact quite general. Thus I was led to the very broad generalization which I announced in The Alienist and Neurologist for August 1907 under the title of The Erotogenesis of Religion and further discussed in the American Journal of Religious Psychology, 1908. In the present essay, I will recount some of those facts of Mormonism which first led me to the wider fields of investigation into the psychology of religion from the viewpoint of sexual psychology. I will begin by first stating some fragmentary information as to the character of the revival excitement during which Mormon theology was evolved, and then follow this with a study of that theology and my explanation of the psychic processes by which sensualism is, tr is transformed into the testimony of the Holy Spirit and the frenzy of fanaticism. At some other time, I will expose the accompanying abnormal sexual enthusiasm as these work themselves out in the polygamous social system. The Kirtland Revival Most esoteric Mormonism is the outgrowth of, or intertwined with, the ceremonials and practice of polygamy. Mormon polygamy found its beginning in 1831 at or near Kirtland, Ohio where raged within the church a most extraordinary religious excitement. This revival was mainly the work of Sidney Rigdon, a skilled revivalist and intense enthusiast, who theretofore had been one of the founders of the Christian or Campbellite church, and at that time of his conversion to Mormonism was one of its most popular preachers. The method of working up the enthusiasm was that ordinarily employed by the Orthodox revivalists. When the Mormons of that time were about to partake of the sacrament, the doors and windows would be closed and scenes enacted which resembled and in fact were the conduct of the insane. Quote, many false prophets were introduced, many strange visions were seen, unquote. among them being Martin Harris vision of the devil who quote looked like a jackass and he had hair like a mouse unquote. at the dead hour of night young men might be seen running over the fields and hills in pursuit as they said of balls of fire lights etc which they saw moving through the air black pete a negro convert uh, caught sight of a revelation carried by black angels with hair and made chase to secure the treasure. Utterly blind to his surroundings, he and his mad infatuation ran over the edge of a precipice, dropping through the branches of a tree into, sh into the Chagrin River. These fits of contagious enthusiasm usually came on after prayer meetings, which were held almost every evening the gift of miracles and the power of the Holy Ghost were imparted by the laying on of, on, on of hands and followed by strange manifestations. Many would fall upon the floor, remaining there for some time in seeming lifelessness, sometimes claiming that the Spirit of God had thrown them down, passing them through a new and miraculous form of death which had imparted to them immortality. The young men and women, who probably were by abstinence, 
uh, living together unnatural sex lives besides undergoing the nervous disturbances incident to adolescence and pubescence were more particularly subject to these deliriums. They would exhibit all the apish actions imaginable, making the most ridiculous grimaces, creeping upon all fours, rolling upon the frozen ground, going through all the Indian modes of warfare such as knocking down, scalping, ripping open, and tearing out the bowels. At other times they would run through the fields, get upon stumps, preach to imaginary congregations, enter the water, perform baptismal and other ceremonies. Many's, many would have fits of gibbering called talking in tongues. Uh, meetings were broken up by the shouting of some brother possessed by the Holy Ghost. Some labored under the hallucinations that they saw angels. Others received letters from heaven. Still others saw the face of the Savior. One of the insane, while seeming to be endeavoring to jump through the ceiling, proclaimed the arrival of the hosts of heaven and the horsemen. Almost a score of prophets arose, each securing revelations, performing miracles, and often disputing the genuineness of Smith's title to the prophetic office. There seemed danger that the whole Mormon community would become infected by the contagion of this emotional insanity, and this resulted in the prophets taking alarm and announcing a, re a revelation in which God discountenanced all these ex excesses. The Evolution of Mormon Sensualism those who have studied most carefully the history of fanaticism and the evidences bearing upon the correlation of religious frenzy and sexual enthusiasm will at least be surprised to learn that during the Mormon revival excitement at Kirtland, many yielded to the spirit of adultery, including apostles and other prominent Mormons, and that contemporaneously with this widespread yielding to the spirit of adultery, the Mormon prophet first had revealed to him the beauties and the eternity of the marriage covenant, including a plurality of wives, together with further esoteric doctrines upon the same subject, which had not yet been made public. Anti-polygamy standard and Mormon portraits 250 to 251 contain information not elsewhere published as to these beginnings, unless by inadvertence. The new convert at this time was saluted by the high priest of Mormonism with a kiss of charity. Under the fostering care of the intense revival excitement, the evolution from the kiss of charity through theories of spiritual wifery to polygamy in the flesh was a sensual growth by natural and easy stages which probably reached its highest degree of abnormity in, the, in another revival excitement. Between 1855 to 60 there raged in various parts of Utah another intense religious frenzy generally, generally known as the Reformation. The emotional phases were quite pronounced as at Kirtland. In the meantime, polygamy had become a publicly avowed church doctrine and practice. All was marrying and giving in marriage. The divinity of the poly polygamic institution and the duty to procreate as man's highest obligation to the deity were the burden of almost every exhortation. In the average Mormon mind, but little corrupted by learning, intellectual and sensual pleasures seldom, even momentarily, contest with each other for supremacy. Intellectual incapacity precludes that introspection which alone would enable the Mormon to resolve his religio-psychic states into their constituent elements of unreasoned emotion and untamed lust. Mormons, once having accepted sex functioning as the highest duty, and polygamy as marriage institution offering most opportunity for a prolific offspring, and being constantly under the influence of an environment which, through preaching and practice, was directing the attention of sex matters, it was unavoidable that abnormal sex appetites should be developed. Poverty often compelled polygamists to occupy the same bed 
with two or three wives and their children to sleep in the same room. Public discussion of polygamy in which both the beneficence and sinfulness of their unconventional sexuality were highly overvalued, the vehement exhortation to uphold its practice, and the exigencies of family life and the polygamy of the poor, and nearly all were poor, necessarily centered the attention of all unduly upon matters of sex, and thus in one generation sex abnormity was being cultivated, which perhaps might be transmitted to the next as a congenital hypertrophy of sex organs which combined with continual suggestions pregnant with sex overvaluation created an abnormal predisposition to erotism having developed from normal man through revival excitement the hyperesthesia sexualis and having provided the opportunities for excesses which among such people is best offered by polygamy there is soon developed a class of men exhausted by the supersatiation in normal sexual indulgence who by the psychopathic condition are irresistibly compelled to search after unusual stimulants for their lagging passions and whose sexual activity therefore finds expression in the abuse of children incestuous, incestuously and otherwise in sadism and in pederasty I have the testimony of a witness somewhat discredited by the morbidity of mind, which testimony, if true, would establish beyond a doubt that Bishop John D. Lee and some of his associates in the southern Utah murders of about 1887 were sadists. William Hooper Young, a grandson of Brigham Young, is now for the second time a convict. His present 1903 confinement in a New York penitentiary is for the murder of one Mrs. Pulitzer. The circumstances of the murder indicate very clearly that the murder was ex executed pursuant to sadistic mania. Both prosecution and defense were unwilling to take chances on the outcome of a trial on the plea of insanity. For one, it might mean electrocution, for the other, acquittal. Therefore, during the trial, an agreement was reached for a plea of guilty to a lesser degree of murder and a jail sentence. The author has also quite unimpeachable evidence that by several of the older polygamists living in the year 1880, pederasty was practiced. This is but the natural and necessary consequence of conditions such as environed the Mormon mass. The development is not in the least unlike the progress of all forms of psychopathia sexualis. With this much by way of suggestion, to aid the lay mind in, in interpreting the facts and creating a conviction of antecedent probability in favor of the developments to follow, and some which space, which space limits may require me to leave some future essay, let us examine the growth of this disease in greater detail with special reference to its influence on Mormon theology. Mormon Theology and Sensualism The average Mormon being deplorably wanting in every element of higher mental development, and for that, as well as by nerve constitution, being of mystic tendencies, was through intensity of religious emotions and teachings easily obsessed by sexualism. Thus conditioned, sexualism determined its theology, and mysticism read both into divine mind. The stamp of its degeneracy is upon every feature of the Mormon cult, and the sexual reason is at the foundation of its peculiar theological truisms. The capacity for procreation of species, especially by being one of many equal and coordinate bodily functions, is made the greatest power of God bestowed, bestowed on man, and the greatest promise of his seed as the sands of the seashore. If sex organs are the beneficent evidence of God's greatest power bestowed upon man, we logically deduce the correlative obligation of men towards God to beget the greatest possible number of pious offering. We are created for the express purpose of increase. If begetting pious children 
in the greatest number is our conception of man's highest duty towards God, then naturally, since the gods are always but man's objectified ideals, God is represented as a polygamist. And the marriage at Cana of Galilee is proclaimed the marriage of Jesus to Mary, Martha, and others. Of course, it would be senseless to have a polygamous God unless he could procreate godlets. Procreative powers, therefore, are not only God-given, but God-like. Progeny is the direct offspring of God. The gods are now made to possess all the parts and passions of, per of a perfect man. Gods, angels, and men are all one species, one race, and one great family. And Joseph, Miss, Joseph, Joseph Smith is as much the son of God as is Jesus. The gods have power to beget sons and daughters in the spirit world who, through their occupation of temporal bodies of flesh and bone, are the, themselves prepared for godhood, and like great gods, their fathers, they in turn become possessed of his godly power of propagating their species through all eternity. The necessity of tabernacles of flesh, which sons and daughters of God must inhabit for a time as a condition of their development to godhood, is the reason why the head God commanded Eve to multiply and replenish the earth, and thus imposed a like sexual duty upon all of Eve's daughters. We are the literal sons and daughters of God, and Adam, our first earthly parent, becomes the God of this world, and the only God with whom we have to do. He brought Eve, one of his wives, with him, and through him we came into being. Adam, the God of this world, came here from another planet, in having potential immortality. Uh, thus man is literally the offspring of a divine father and mother. Had it not been for the fall, Adam would have reigned through all eternity as king with Eve as queen. Through the fall, Adam and his offspring became mortal, and their descendants became the earthly and mortal inhabitation of the spiritual offspring of the other gods. Only through the fall of Adam and their consequent mortality, coupled with the eternity of the Mormon marriage covenant, has it been made possible for us to become gods and to have an immortal progeny. It has been discovered by the reader that the Mormon god has not always been a god, but was once as we are now, and is but an exalted man who sits enthroned, enthroned in yonder heaven. Even as Adam is the god of this world, so are Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, and all their successors in the prophetic office of the Mormon church, each a god to this people. When all the morning stars sang together, and the sons of God shouted for joy, Jesus, and probably Joe, were there, not as the fleshly descendants of our Adam God, for he had not been placed in Missouri, which according to Mormons contains the Garden of Eden, as quoted in Hyde's Mormonism. They were the spiritual sons and daughters of God who to the number of millions were awaiting their turn and their opportunity to take tabernacles of flesh and bodies until the closing up of the scene of this creation. All these were present when God commenced this creation. Jesus was also there and superintended the work, for by him God made the worlds. They knew that the creation then being formed was for their abiding place, where their spirits would go and take upon themselves tabernacles of flesh and bones, and they rejoiced at the prospect. They saw that their spirits, without tabernacles, never could be made perfect, never could be placed in a position to attain great power, dominion, and glory like their father. The unstated but evident reason is that without their body of flesh they could not procreate subjects over which whom they could reign, but must themselves remain subjects. 
Thus, we all have within us a tangible portion of the deity, and it is, quote, it is the deity within us that causes increase, unquote, and therefore it is our capacity for increase that measures our exaltation or progress toward becoming gods, and each added wife is but an, but an added means of exaltation in the celestial kingdom. It is capacity for reproduction that is the only distinction given in Mormon literature between the lower and higher degrees of celestial exaltation. When the saints talk about becoming gods through accepting the testimony of Jesus and complying with Mormon ordinances, uh, they really mean that through the eternity of the marriage co covenant, as they alone have the divine power of administering it, they can guarantee to their devotees the continuance of sex choice in the hereafter. It is an error quite prevalent outside of Mormonism to believe that Mormons consider polygamy a proper or per permissible condition for all. The fact is not so, even for all Mormons. The right to have more than one wife comes as a reward for piety and attaches only to those Mormons who have secured special divine sanction. All sexual commerce by a married man, and not thus authorized, is denounced as adultery, and the guilty invite the death penalty, therefore, under the Mormon doctrine of blood atonement. To restore fallen mortal man to the state of Adamic purity and immortality is the mission of Mormonism, and eternal marriage, for the solemnization of which it has a divinely authorized monopoly, is a means to that end. Marriage is regarded by the Latter-day Saints as a sacrament. Under its high ecclesiastical law, it involves an everlasting covenant that does not end with death. The marriage does not take place in the resurrection, but in time and in this world. It is the nature of that marriage in the Garden of Eden between a man and a woman in whom there was no death. It was the wedding of immortals. That which was lost through sin in the fall was restored through obedience in the atonement of Christ in the regeneration and the resurrection brings the parted pair together again as one no more twain, but one flesh. Spiritual, spirit according to Mormonism is but refined matter, but tangible and eternal. That which is scaled on earth today by divinely revealed Mormon authority is sealed in heaven and remains, in spite of death, immutable and abides forever. Quote, the family thus formed is the basis of an ever-increasing kingdom and dominion continuing in worlds without end. Marriages are permitted for time only, as not all persons are fitted for the higher conditions and the pure and sacred obligations they impose." Unquote. Joseph F. Smith, in the Arena, May 1903. Those whom the Mormon priesthood have not permitted to comply with those ordinances for an eternal marriage or those who have willfully foregone the responsibility of maternity will in heaven be only ministering angels. That is, a sort of celestial scrub woman to the more exalted Mormon, it must remain in servitude without prospect of queenhood or hope of sexualism and the resulting immortal progeny. Even a man cannot be saved in the hereafter without having a woman at his side. Yeah, because without her, that procreation, which is the distinguishing feature of Godhood and his pleasures, is absent. Those who are more perfected in Godhood, by having been sealed in marriage for eternity, will be capacitated to enjoy the relationship of husband and wife, of parent and child, and a hundredfold de degree greater than in immortality. Thus heavenly joys are but intensified sensualisms. Instead of the God-given power of procreation being one of the chief things, the pass away is one of the chief th means of exaltation and glory in that great eternity. Latter-day Saints believe in a literal, physical resurrection of the flesh and bone of man. To them all is material. 
The eternity of the marriage relation is therefore not a mere mystical union of immaterial and embodied spirits, as others understand the spiritual, but it means the sex functioning in heaven of resurrected flesh and bone, men and women begetting spiritual and eternal offspring. The polygamous home is held sacred by the saints as the beginning of their heaven. Those who remain in the flesh after Christ comes will continue to beget children during the millennium. According to uh, Mormonism, the spiritual is but refined matter. So likewise, the Holy Ghost necessarily ceases to be one with God the Father, <coughs> or God the Son, but they are three distinct personages. But a sexual reason must be assigned, and Brigham Young accommodates us. If the Son was begotten by the Holy Ghost, it would be very dangerous to baptize and confirm the females and give the Holy Ghost to them, lest he should be, lest he should beget children to be palmed upon by the elders of the people, bringing the elders into great difficulties. For these reasons, Mormon authorities assert that Jesus was begotten by an ordinary human process and in his turn he begot children by his polygamous wives. Conclusion Thus Mormon theologians have unconsciously exhibited to us the innermost offering of their own minds by having accurately portrayed to us gods of their own creation made in their own image. These gods are sensualists whose exaltation Mormon priests hope to attain through sexualism and enjoy in a heaven whose greatest and only advertised bliss will be intensified animalism prolonged through e e eternity. Thus Mormon theology is seen to be the result of intellectual exigencies imposed by an abnormal sensualism. And now we come to trace the psychic processes by which lewdness is transformed into that which is believed to be the grace of God. In an article entitled, Religion and Sensualism as Connected by Clergymen, uh, American Journal of Religious Psychology, 1908, I showed by the published observations of many clergymen that, that the concurrence of great sexual enthusiasm with religious frenzy is not a peculiarity of Mormonism, but quite general in all religions. Our interpretation of the foregoing facts of Mormonism is that the correct explanation may serve as a working hypothesis for the interpretation of all of the more or less intense experiences of all religionists who interpret the peculiarities of their religious emotions as the inward testimony of the indwelling Holy Ghost. The revival excitement is always most potent in the production of religious frenzy with those whose nervous organism is subject to the disturbances incident to sexual maturing or sexual decline, and upon persons who from unnatural sex lives or general neurosis are generally susceptible to a profound agitation from the reasonless sensationalism of revival pulpiteers. The above stated uh, prevailing conditions of converts, the character of the exciting sermons, and the abundance of sexual allegory and insinuations to induce a con conviction of sin and the extravagant emphasis which the sermonizer puts upon spiritual and divine love to secure the reaction of a spiritual exaltation ascribed to the possession of the Holy Ghost all these circumstances, with the abundant historical facts as to their sexual results, unmistakably indicate the physiological source of all these disturbances is the sex nerve centers. So it comes, unavoidably, that the verbalisms of spiritual love, true to their source, will find their physiological interpretation and manifestation in sex passion. Since an abnormally sensitive and disturbed condition of the reproduction mechanism is the most fruitful soil in which to develop the religious enthusiast. It is reasonable to expect that the sensualism resultant from revival excitement will be abnormally intense. 
Out of this very abnormity comes the declining power of the restraint imposed by moral conventions and the overstepping of their bounds. When it comes, is primarily due to subjective causes and not to a repudiation of the usual standards due to any reasoned view derived from the objective study of human sex relations. In the highly relot highly wrought condition of religious excitement, some one more ingenuous or more intense than the rest evolves theories for the spiritualization of the f physical appetite and the ecstatic joy of the convert readily certifies to the iner er inerrancy of any doctrine which has been suggested into his mind and has become to him seemingly an inseparable associate of his ecstatic condition. Thus the sensual origin determines the character of the doctrine evolved, and the necessities which origin imposed, and thus it furnishes the superhuman evidences of his own verity. The convert now knows because he feels, and is con firmly convinced because strongly agitated, and that is the knowledge by faith and not from some reason, the testimony of the Holy, Holy Ghost, and at the same time the joy that passeth, the joy that passeth, all understanding. All this is but the misinterpretation of an unidentified sex ecstasy, which in its acute stages evolves all the horrors which can come and have come, from a combination of the delirium of sensuality and the frenzy of fanaticism. In its milder stages of enormity, it becomes the determinant of some conventional code of sex morals. Here it begins by evolving into theories for the spiritualization of the sexual impulse, accompanied by a mad overvaluation of sex importance. When it is the sinfulness of sensual love that is overestimated, the tendency will be toward an enforced asceticism propagated through intense moral sentimentalizing celibacy as a duty uh, is most like to, likely to be the result if women are the dominant factor of the group. On the other hand, if men exercise an effective control, the more intense and the more genius among them will evolve theories for the sanctification, sanctification of their abnormal lusts. So comes the mad overvaluation of the sacredness of the duty to multiply and replenish the earth, accompanied by the religious enforcement of sexual irregularity, such as polygamy, polyandry, and the compulsory promiscuity. Now the religiously determined conscience sanctions in these fanatics what is, what is condemned by the conscience of others similarly, de similarly determined. From such facts as are disclosed by a study of Mormonism and any number of other sects, we may fairly expect to find an explanation for all the varied phenomena of religious life as distinguished from secular activities. From an exhaustive study of all religious enthusiasms, such as I have herein partially displayed as to Mormonism, it may yet be that the materialist monist may find a more satisfactory explanation for the riddle of religion than has yet been offered, and it may be this, the ultimate source of all religion of personal experience is sex and the essence of its sub subjective testimony for the truth of its teaching is the mere misinterpretation of an unidentified sex ecstasy.